at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in DeSoto, Missouri. If this is your first time or your uh, umpteenth time, we thank you for checking in with us and we want you to know that, that our hope is uh, that uh, if we haven't already, uh, that we find ways to, to, to make the kind of connections uh, that help us feel as if we, uh, that we are a part of God's great plan for humanity, a plan that includes fulfillment, and purpose. Uh, it is no accident that, uh, that you are here today, and because of that, we want to make the best use of your time. Uh, so let us take time to hear God's word for today. It's a word from Genesis that, that has a lot to do with purpose, a purpose that comes in the most unlikely of ways. Uh, hear then this reading from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 19. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set upon the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring." Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place. There is none other than the house of God or we should say that again. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on it, on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Would you join me in prayer? God of all that is, you know our victories as well as our defeats. You know our inner thoughts as well as you know our outer and public statements. You see the light that we have in us and that you, uh, you know the darkness that so frequently robs us of being all that you created us to be. And so with all that, here we are, we come to you, longing to know your ways, knowing that it is only by your grace that we celebrate the light and move through the darkness. We pray that your light may come to those who seek ways to break the barriers uh, that have been affected or that have happened through this COVID-19 crisis. We pray that your light may spring forth and uncover the darkness that, that seems to be having its day in, in this world of racial unrest. May the medical professionals who care for the sick and the vulnerable, may they be given an extra dose of your light this hour and this day. And may those who fight against the injustices and the unrest, that they may also have light and see your light as well. And may we trust you and follow you as you speak to us in this time. These things we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm glad that you are here today uh, in, this, in this time of worship at St. Andrews. Uh, and I, um, I want to go right here from the start, okay? I, I want to give you a dare. All right, uh, we're going to get this out of the way uh, so that we can move on to the things that, uh, that I would want you to know for this day. Now, of course, after hearing the dare, you may uh, find that you will be unable to fulfill your part of the dare. And, well, then you're just going to have to listen to the sermon anyway. So anyway, here is my dare to you. I dare you not to think of two songs. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder or stairway to heaven at any time during this message. In fact, I'm going to double dog dare you not to think of we are climbing Jacob's ladder or stairway to heaven at any time during this sermon. Of course, uh, now that you probably can't get either songs out of your head, uh, it might do me well to give you a little bit of explanation. Uh, for most of us, uh, anytime we hear uh, a Bible reading that involves uh, Jacob's dream and the ladder kind of going up and down from heaven, uh, it is very hard to get one or both of those songs out of our heads. That's just kind of how we are wired. Uh, therefore, I thought it would be nice and upfront just to, uh, you know, just be upfront about those two songs uh, so that you would not have to feel guilty if your mind begins to head off in those directions, say, I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. Um, you know, we think of Jacob's Ladder and, and who of us haven't thought of a, a, a summer camp or a vacation Bible school or a Sunday school time, even a music class in school, and it just kind of runs through our head. And, and I'm not going to find you guilty of those Eric Clapton guitar licks uh, don't somehow work its way into your mind. You know those ones that, that sort of turn that song from a, from a slow song into a fast song, and then you begin to think, why couldn't Eric Clapton just leave well enough alone and let it be a slow song? At, well, at least that's what I heard from a friend. Maybe I should triple dog dare you to not think of one of those songs. But here's the point. It is probably easier uh, just to think of one or both of those songs uh, than it is to think about how God may be speaking to us through a dream or, or through those times when our mind wanders into the, into the what ifs of life. You know, uh, what, if, 
What if I could do what my heart desires? What if I had the courage to really step out in faith? What if the sky was truly the limit? You know, uh, it would be easy to get caught up uh, in, in the brain function of dreams and, and satisfy ourselves with a little conversation uh, that comes to the conclusion that, you know, it's just one of those uh, mysteries of life. Uh, but if we are honest with ourselves, in our most truthful moments, the questions that surround life's what ifs will come around again. What if I could do my heart's desires? What if I had the courage to really step out in faith? What if the sky was, was truly the limit? The story is told of Helen Keller being asked, what could be worse than being born blind? She responded, to have sight and no vision. Last week, I, I made the statement that as it relates to relationships in one's life, uh, contempt is the place where dreams die, uh, where a vision for the future dies. Well, if this story um, of Jacob tells, tells me, tells us anything, it is that even though someone may have been a, a conniving opportunist uh, of the worst sort, you know, the kind who takes... Uh, advantage of his brother's weaknesses. Even if that's the case, God still has a plan for someone's life. And if you're hearing this today, and do you believe that, that the life's twists and turns has left you without a dream? I want you to know God has a plan for your life as well. And that your next dream of God's plan for your life may actually be a little closer than you think. Jacob, for instance, Jacob was on the run uh, from his brother Esau, who was bent on revenge. You know, that goes back to that whole buying the birthright for a, for a, a pot of stew thing. Uh, so there was uh, Jacob on the run from his brother, seeking revenge. He was seek Esau was seeking revenge. Uh, Jacob stopped at a nondescript place because uh, he more or less ran out of daylight. Uh, his resources were so few that he ended up using a rock for a pillow. And then he had an encounter, an encounter with God that renewed his belief that God still had a plan for his life. So significant was this dream of Jacob that this, that this fairly nondescript place and rock became Bethel, became the house of God. So here is my question. Here's my question. How do events such as running for your life, sleeping without a shelter, and having a rock for a pillow, how do all of those things turn into Bethel, the house of God? I can only speak for myself, but in some ways, that is why I worship God. You know, I might be going to sleep one night thinking that uh, life as I know it may be no more. But before the sun rises the next day, that God has given me a new purpose, something that tells me that God is not through with me. And I would guess that many of you could probably say that very same thing in one way or another. January 5th, 1975. That was the day that the bell rang out for the first time at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. But it was not that first time that the bell actually had rung. Before it was at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, it was the, the church bell for St. John Methodist Church, a church that sat at the corner of Stone and Blow Streets in DeSoto, where we are right now. Well, in the 1960s, uh, the membership of St. John was going down in, in such a way that uh, around 1967, 
the painful decision was made to close St. John, a church that had been around for nearly 100 years. In fact, it had begun around 1870. Um, and what had happened in the closing of it was that the members then were offered the opportunity uh, to merge with St. Andrews, a decision that some 13 or so people uh, decided to do, they took. Uh, the St. John property uh, was then uh, under the care of St. Andrews and it was used for, for social events, uh, a mission, Sunday school, uh, even a thrift store. Uh, in my limited research uh, on this, I learned that a summer vacation Bible school was held at the St. John location after, after these joining together. Uh, and it was held there. And, and I said, well, why was it held there? Well, from the words of a person who had worked it said, because that's where the children were. Time went on. Uh, in July 1984, uh, the Board of Trustees uh, voted to sell the St. John property. Within a few months, the property sold uh, and the building was subsequently torn down. But the bell of St. John was still ringing. And the legacy of St. John Methodist Church continued to live on. I'm going to reach down here and get something. I'm not going to hold it up for long because it's a little bit big. Okay, now no, this isn't the bell. <laughs> uh, but what I'm showing you right now uh, is the pulley that once rang the bell at St. John Methodist Church. Uh, this pulley uh, is actually mounted at the front entrance of St. Andrews. Uh, there's a small plaque uh, that's dated on this. It's on here. Uh, I think I'm probably holding right at it, but uh, it's dated uh, January 1975, uh, nine years before the property was sold. Now, here, here is this pulley, and the interesting thing is, when I position it in this way, you may be able to tell that it actually becomes the cross of St. Andrew. I'm going to put it down, okay? Maybe I'll stand back here just a moment and let you get a good look at it. So you see this, this pulley, and you see it turned that way, that it becomes the cross of St. Andrew. I'll set it down over here. Coming back to you. The cross of St. Andrew. Well, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Andrew and Simon Peter being the first two people that Jesus specifically recruited as his followers. The Gospel of John gives Andrew even more credit than that. It's saying that Andrew was the first person called by Jesus and then, he, and then Andrew went to uh, his brother Simon Peter uh, to tell him about Jesus. Now, of course, uh, when Simon Peter kind of came into the spotlight, Andrew sort of faded uh, into the background. Uh, you know, strong personalities have a way of doing those things. That's, that's just the way it is. But some have called him uh, St. Andrew, you know, the, the first missionary. He's the guy that went out and told his brother and brought his brother in. Legend has it that before Andrew was crucified, as were many of the apostles, before he was crucified, he convinced his Roman executioners to use a differently shaped cross than that on which Jesus was crucified. You know, uh, perhaps it was, and that was not uncommon because he felt as if he wasn't worthy to be crucified in that manner. And so it went to that manner. But there's something even more important about uh, about the St. Andrew's cross or about the, the pulley, about the bell from St. John Methodist Church that now rings at St. Andrew's. You see, uh, St. John Methodist Church was, in the words of that day, a black church in DeSoto. Uh, there was a church that formed, and like I'd said earlier, around 1870, and it was formed after the slaves had been freed. And that's an important piece of information to remember as far as some of these years, because in the 1840s, some 30 years earlier, in the 1840s, when the Methodist church in America was splitting over 
the slavery issue, the Methodist contingency that lived in Jefferson County, our county, decided to join the ranks of the Methodist Church South. That's right, South. In case you haven't put two and two together, the church that is now St. Andrew's was a Southern sympathizing church. The bell, the pulley, that forms the cross of St. Andrew, the symbol by whose name we identify, came to St. Andrew's because of its affiliation with St. John Methodist Church, a church that by some standards would be completely justified if it had absolutely nothing to offer a church that began as a Southern sympathizing church. Instead, it has offered us a symbol, a logo by which we identify. There are those who would call this kind of information scandalous. You know what I call it? I call it grace. Or as John Wesley would call it, the personal presence of the Holy Spirit that lives in the lives of people. The, the personal presence of the Holy Spirit in the people of St. John who made sure that a bell calling out uh, people to church, calling people to faith in, in Christ would continue to ring. That pulley, the symbol, has much to tell us. Much to tell us about, about being mission-minded, about how we live out our personal faith in Jesus Christ, how we serve together as, as, as a body of believers. Today, today, it tells us that God's grace is bigger than whatever our failures may be. And it tells us that, that while our past needs to inform us about the present, it does not have to define our future. Because our future is defined by God's grace. So significant was Jacob's experience of God's message at that place that he named the place Bethel, the house of God. I think you should know one other thing. Of the membership that came from St. John Methodist Church to St. Andrews, one particular couple stood out as perhaps two of the most faithful, God-fearing people one would have ever met. They were the Prices. The husband's name was John, okay, <laughs> and the wife's name, well, her name was Bethel. Now, they have long since gone on to the heaven's glory, but the message of John and Bethel will still ring out every time we ring that bell. Every time we look at the cross of St. Andrew, every time we live out the message, the dream, that God has a purpose for our being here and that we can live into the future because of the gift of God's grace. God's grace shown uh, to the people of St. Andrews in many ways by the people of St. John Methodist Church. God's grace that is shown to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today, I ask you, to embrace the grace that God has given you. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the promise of purpose and meaning that is found in grace, grace that we experience by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, grace that we experience as we receive from others messages of your love and compassion. May we give ourselves to the kind of grace that sees beyond status or position, a grace that recognizes the work you have done, the work that you are doing through expressions of your love for those beyond our walls. May our circle grow 
through your grace in our actions. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite you even now uh, to join me in a statement that has brought Christians together, uh, Christians of all persuasions, uh, Christians from all centuries, that has brought them together in saying these things we believe. And as the words come up on the screen, let us speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear then this benediction. Faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Praise the Lord, which God supplies.